Okay, so welcome to Out of This World Editing. And I know that everybody does different levels of editing, uh, depending on what your preference is in terms of your photography style. But editing gives you the, the ability to extend your uh, creativity from just capture to saying, what else would I like to do with this photo? So the first thing that I do when I edit is I look at cropping the image. And this image is from the last time we met the waterfall image and we had cropped out the uh, fence on the right. So one of the things you, you do with cropping is to change your composition. So it is far better always to try to get your composition correct in camera. But a lot of times in nature, there are things that you can't get around. Uh, if you're at a slippery waterfall or something that you might wanna crop the image afterwards to tell a, a different or a better story. Uh, cropping also allows you to emphasize or draw attention to certain areas, uh, to fix horizon lines or straighten the image. I have a level in my camera, but, and I, no matter what I do, a lot of times my images are just a hair bit not as straight as I'd like them to be. And you can change the aspect ratio, and by aspect ratio, what I mean is, is how long um, and how wide the picture is. So you could take a picture that you took a photo of and you can change it to a panoramic. You can decide you want your picture one by one, any different aspect ratio, different than the way that you actually um, did it in camera. That's different reasons for, for cropping. And so the example here shows you um, the before and after crop that we recommended last time. And what it does, again, is it takes the fence out. Um, it's just a different story that, that it's telling. Okay, so some things to avoid in cropping is uh, you really don't want to cut um, body parts off that shouldn't be cut off. Uh, the picture on this next screen shows um, the fingertips being, being cut off. That's something you really, really don't want to do. You also want to avoid crowding the image. And then there's a certain level of cropping um, that depends on the number of megapixels that you have to begin with. So if you have a low, resolu low resolution picture and you wanna print it, you can only crop it so far before you're giving up too many pixels and you have, you have nothing, nothing left. But again, the um, before and after, it's far less distracting to crop in tight to the face um, rather than have these um, missing body parts. Uh, and if you're cropping, say, your, your um, kids or your grandkids running, you want to always leave a little space for them to be running through the picture. You don't want to crowd too much, unless that's purposeful, that you want to do a really tight crop for a dramatic image. So I have this picture of this woman um, and any suggestions from anybody about if you were going to crop it, what might you do to crop this image? Hopefully it's now on your screen. Any suggestions? My my thought is is that the bottom half is a little bit distracting. And if my focus is her, then I probably would just get the, the top portion more being the picture. Yeah. I don't know. Maggie, do you have a sense of where you might do that? I probably would leave the jacket there mm -hmm. and just kind of, I'd have to see it, you know, to, to kind of, once I started cropping, but um, you would want her elbows 
and so that you can see her hands. I, I, I like the hands because I think it kind of goes with her expression as kind of showing what she's doing. It gives it a different look. So yeah, so maybe waistline or a little bit below. Anybody else suggestions? There's too much vacant space to the left. I'd crop it, you know, with the better fingertips on her left hand. And, uh, and then if, if, as Maggie said, take it, you know, to the bottom of the coat, unless you were gonna add some script to that side and explain something, but that's just yeah. unnecessary wasted space over there. Yeah, it is almost, this is a, a, this is a stock image from Getty and it's almost like they did set it up so that, that you could put text or advertisement or something um, mm -hmm. to her side, um, particularly the way, way her hand is. Um, he is kind of looking a little bit to her right. So you might use the rule of thirds when you're cropping and keep her to the right of the picture. Yeah. And again, the rule of thirds, you divide the screen into nine quadrants and uh, decide the, the eye tends to go to um, where those quadrants meet. And so, yeah, she's a little bit not, she's a little bit, a little bit off. Mm -hmm. So the next screen, I've done a series of different crops and, and what I found when I did the um, horizontal one is it was a really a little bit difficult to get her the left and the right sort of balance that that middle crop on on this next screen is sort of still bothering me um, mainly because you know her foot's over the air so it that leads you a little bit to the right but then there's not a lot of space to the hand but <clears throat> The one on the far right is, is Maggie's suggestion in terms of, you know, where you might crop it in order to, in order to, um, in order to just emphasize the upper body. Um, you just have to be people to do it in a space that makes the most sense for, um, for making it attractive. Um, and then the, the tight crop um, at her shoulders just tells a whole different story. It's, it's almost like when you look at these three pictures, particularly the tight crop, um, it, it, you get a different, you get a whole different message from it. So cropping can do a lot. If you're going to crop it that tight again, um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a lot of pixels left to be able to um, do a big print from it given how much we've cropped away. Now certain cameras, every camera you're shooting at different numbers of megapixels um, and that's even true on on the different camera phones of how many megapixels those phones are, are storing. Um, and I have like two cameras sitting here. One is the megapixels are over 40, the other one's at 22. So the amount that I can crop on that one camera is very different than on the, on the one with the lesser megapixels. And the suggestion, and I'm gonna say it a lot when we get to editing, is that as you're editing, after you've, after you've made an edit, look at it, a hundred percent to see if it's pixely or not because what happens is while you're editing on your computer a lot of times you your picture is only 33 percent of the size or 50 percent of the size and when you look at it fully then you start to see those make those pixels being pulled apart but you can see how cropping really can do a lot to to look at your, at, to look and change the nature of, of the message. So I have another, another example of, of somebody. Um, again, if this gentleman is up on your screen, somebody, any suggestions about where you would crop? This is the way, this is the way the, the stock image is. Um, thoughts on cropping?
Mm. I'll jump in again. I, I think this one's a little bit tough because of the way his eyes are looking over his left shoulder. Um, so, but, you know, it, it's, the, it, to me, his, his hand in his pocket, his shoes all kind of distracts from his face. So, um, you know, if, you're, if that's what you want people to see is the face, then I think you again have to crop out a lot of his body, but I almost would move him to the left a little bit also. To um, his left or our left? Our left. <laughs> Yeah, okay. sorry. So you move him over. Okay. I think Anyone so, else? just because of the way his eyes are. It's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. I'd have, yeah. I guess it depends on what he's, what you're trying to crop for. I mean, if you're selling boots, you know, leave the boots. If you're selling a jacket, you know, waist up. I, I don't know. <clears throat> uh, I kind of like Maggie's idea, you know, crop out. I, I would say, if, if it were me, I would say waist up, mm -hmm. um, keep and waist down, lose, yeah. bring it in a little tighter, keep the elbow in. So again, I... I did a, a series of different crops. Um, and it's it's sort of on this one when this when the screen does come up, um, it's fascinating because you know, I think Maggie's comment about which way the eyes were. If you look at the two crops on the right, um, I've got them in two different places and and they do very different things in terms of of the expression on, um, it just changes, to me, it changes the image completely. Um, again, these are things that if you were taking the picture, better to do in camera, but if you're gonna make a crop on the legs, um, a natural place because of the way his hands hang down would be at the knees. That's a, you know, you just have to be careful of, of where those crop areas are. Um, and I left him a little bit more on the on the long crop towards the right because of when Dennis said I, I sort of wanted to get his head closer to those those quadrants of the, the rule of thirds. But I definitely did more of that on the, the right hand side of, of the the portraits. But cropping, whether cropping in the waterfall or cropping people, cropping is the first, I, 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 when I'm editing say, what is it that I want this story to be? And can I change and improve that story by how I'm cropping? Do I have enough megapixels to, to really be able to crop it in a way that tells the story? And sometimes even with um, landscapes, I'll do multiple crops and do different things. In the mountains, I might do a panoramic, which is long and narrow. I might do uh, one that is um, portrait up and down, um, and then maybe a traditional. Um, my camera shoots at um, two by three, uh, so I leave it in, in the original crop setting. But cropping is the first tool that I do in, in editing. Um, mainly because I also, as I'm doing other adjustments, I wanna see what it's doing and I don't wanna adjust an area that I end up throwing away anyhow um, or spending time fixing an area that, that I'm going to throw away. <clears throat> so we're gonna take apart um, this next photo that's coming up of the of the, uh, I think he's a German Shepherd. And um, again, this is a stock photo that I pulled down and um, let's analyze um, this one. In terms of a crop, um, 
if if we were going to start this say this is a picture i took of my dog running and i'm now getting ready to edit it if i start it by cropping what's the most likely crop that i'm going to do on the left side yeah get rid of the left have them running running to to the to the right there's no reason that he's center um, you know, th there are times where I, even though it's called the rule of thirds, that we break that rule, but for this image with movement from left to right, you want, you want that movement continuing to the right hand side. So that's the first thing that we're going to, to do. And so a couple of different crops that you could do. Again, uh, it depends on whether you're going to print it because the crop on the uh, left-hand side of the next screen, um, I cropped it almost more like a panorama um, just to give more of that motion from left to right. And then the other crop is a more traditional one if I was going to print it. Um, again, it, it, gives you, it gives you different feelings of um, of that that image. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Photoshop Elements, for those that have Photoshop Elements, I don't know how many of you do. When you open up Photoshop Elements, this sort of almost website-like page comes up. And, um, and at least the version, I had um, 2021 version that I downloaded. Um, and you have an option of going to an organizer, to the photo editor, or a video editor. And then you have, you have a whole series of, you have a whole series of these sort of um, panels that come up and it, it says, what do you want to do today? So you can almost go in and say, today I want to crop my image, I want to make a movie. <clears throat> and it can walk you through those different types of things. But for the purpose of this one, um, we're gonna mainly we're gonna mainly look at the photo editor and see what it can do. And again, all photo editors, um, all photo editors have the same principles to them, whether you're using um, the free the free Snapseed that's on your phone, whether you're using the native one in your in your Android or your your iPhone, they all work um, and let you do similar things. They just may call them different things. But if you have Photoshop Elements, um, the you know, you can use the organizer. What the organizer will do is it will catalog your pictures. It will let you label them. Um, it's again your your choice about whether you want to do that, and we can in another session talk about storage and um, how to organize your images. <clears throat> so the first thing again I do is is do cropping, and this is an image of Photoshop Elements cropping every single. Or, again, if you're on an iPhone or anything, is the little sort of um, the little cropping image that's um, highlighted on, on the left-hand side here. <clears throat> when you're cropping, um, again, you can go with no restrictions or you can have a pull-down menu and it will give you um, different dimensions. You're it will always tell you what your long and your 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 um you your width and your height will be. <clears throat> what Photoshop Elements in the quick mode and there's this one is um, showing the quick mode. There's a guided mode and an expert mode. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> In the quick mode, it offers um, cropping suggestions and it's doing it by finding the subject and trying to go with the rule of thirds. So you can <clears throat> either crop by dragging the, the grid to where you want your picture. 
<coughs> excuse me, or you can take one of their cropping suggestions. And then at the end, you, um, you, so that's the very first thing I do. And again, has the ability to crop whether you're a um, simple editor or not, but that's my starting point. The next thing that I look at is I start to look at what are the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows in the image. So the next thing I want to adjust is basically how well it is exposed. <clears throat> and a highlight is the brightest area of the picture. And also on here is your um, histogram. And your histogram tells you <clears throat> for an image, how many pixels you have in any one of these zones. There's not a perfect histogram. With your histogram, if you had your highlights all the way over to the right-hand side, that's missing images. All the way to the left, you have black areas. But when I analyze a picture or when I try to go out and read light, I'm now looking at where are my highlights, which are the bright areas. My midtones are on this one, the seeds and also green and anything gray. And I do all my exposure off my midtones. I want my midtones to, to be well exposed. And then your shadows are your dark areas. So all of your detail in your picture, what you have in detail is always in your highlights. As long as they're not all the way to the right side, your highlights give you the most dimension in detail. Your shadows have the least amount of information. And if you have shadows, um, you, can, you can always decrease shadows or add shadows. It's really hard if you lights too bright. It just has to be just right. So the first thing I'm gonna do is analyze my picture and say, is there something with how light or dark, how much highlights, midtones, and shadows I have in the picture? So the next screen goes back to our picture of our, our canine. I actually pulled up for the way that I had the picture, what the histogram looked like. <clears throat> and you can tell um, on this histogram that we're not, we're not having as many highlights to show the detail of the dog's fur, his the dog's face, and we've got a lot of shadowy areas. And some of it's gonna stay in shadows because in the background, we don't really want that big shadow in the background. But the first thing I look at when I look at this picture and say, how am I, I say, well, it's a tad bit underexposed. With a little bit more light, we're going to get more detail in this photo. And there are different ways to fix exposure. And this is true, again, on any of the different editing tools that you have. So on Photoshop Elements, again, in, in what I'm calling the quick mode, the intuitive thing to do is go and say, I'm going to go to the exposure option and pick exposure. But that's not what I do. And in fact, on my iPhone, I will always see if there's a way to go in and fix shadows, highlights, and midtones separately. What happens when you use your exposure slider alone it adjusts all of them at the same time. So if I say I want to brighten the exposure, it's going to brighten the highlights, it's going to brighten the shadows, and it's going to brighten the midtones all at once. It pulls them all over to increasing exposure. 
if you have the option for adjusting, in this case, it's called lighting, and on your iPhones or on your Androids, on your iPhones, it's going to be, um, if you go into the editor and you, I think it's called light also, if you click the, the down menu on that, it gives you the option again to adjust your shadows, highlights, your whites, your blacks. Um, exposure adjustment is taking a hammer to it and it's too much. So if you have the option, you want to separate out those elements. So again, the next screen, I demonstrated what happened when I pulled the exposure and brightened it a little bit. And now you look at the dog's cheeks almost, and that's too bright. His fur is better. <laughs> Um, but I'm also brightening up trees in the background. I don't want to brighten up. <clears throat> and all the different options that this gave me for brightening exposure did too much all at once. So even though in your camera, you have an exposure composition that looks exactly like the same button and you may do it while you're in camera, when you're editing, you want to be more refined in how you do your edits. So the next screen demonstrates how in Photoshop Elements, if you go to lightning, lighting rather, I'm sorry, I tried the auto levels and the auto contrast and I didn't like any of them. What you can do in Photoshop Elements and again in, um, in your iPhones, it's gonna be shadows and highlights. It doesn't give you a mid-tone option, but most often you don't need to adjust your mid-tones. Your camera does really well with mid-tones. So what I did here is I, I just subtly clicked on shadows. It gave me options and I, you can see I picked one of the options that it auto-adjusted. And then I pulled up the histogram um, and you can see instead of being all the way over to the left now, it's now to the right. And it's, this histogram is gonna stay a little bit to the left because we've got a lot of green. We have a dog who's basically mostly mid-tones. But as you look at the histogram as it's coming over to the right, it's starting to pick up the lightness in, the, in this fur on the cheeks and on the legs and these trees behind. So again, going in and doing subtle uh, shadows and midtones, all I did is I reduced the shadows here. I did not brighten, I didn't brighten the, the highlights because you saw in the exposure one when we did that, we lost all the detail on, on the dog's cheeks. So you, everybody see the advantage of separating out your adjustments. And you can, you can do this on Snapseed on the free app. Do it on your iPhone. You can do it in Windows. Um, just don't do the auto settings. They tend to, they tend to take a hammer to things. Look to be able to separate out adjustments to shadows, midtones, and highlights. The other way you can do it is sometimes if you adjust your blacks, you decrease you decrease the um, shadows. Any questions before I leave this point? This is probably between cropping and adjusting shadows and, and highlights. You can really make your pictures pop and do it in a really quick and easy way and change this picture. Now we've got detail on the dog and the dog's, the dog's fur. Sharon, I have a question <clears throat> and I apologize. I missed, I missed the histogram. Where in photo elements did, are you able to get that? I, I'll show you um, where to pull it up. It's okay. in, it's, it's in the advanced mode and you, it, there's a, I'll show you the setting, I'll demonstrate it. But okay. that's why um, 
in my, my newer cameras and any of the mirrorless cameras, I have that histogram open um, while I'm shooting. Right. So it, it's in my eye and I have it little, but I can see you in it. And if, if I wanted to do a really dark picture and just have a little bit of rim light, it's gonna be, it's gonna be over to that side. But I'm gonna also mm -hmm. show you some tools where you can use uh, uh, what's called levels to adjust the histogram um, and adjust your picture. But this is, this is more basic. Even Snapseed has a histogram that will come up if you, if you go into Snapseed. Um, it, and it just, it's the most useful tool um, in, in looking at what is your, your picture doing. And it doesn't surprise me if I'm taking a picture, you know, of, of, um, of June sandhill cranes that are all gray, it's gonna be a gray picture. So you're gonna have a big peak in the middle. If I'm taking a picture of a white trillium with a really close up, I'm going to see that histogram over to the right. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it goes back and forth depending on it's where your data is. It's also why if you download your pictures, particularly if you're shooting in RAR and not in JPEG, that your picture sizes are all different. It's because of the number of, um, your, your camera doesn't take, it, it stores the, the um, amount of lumen, uh, luminosity and the dynamic range of the color. So one of my pictures, if it, if my histogram had peaks all through the whole thing, that, that file size is going to be because there's a lot of data. If I'm taking a picture of a shadowy, dark sunset, that, that picture this out of the same camera, the actual file may be 50% the size of the other one. So it's not like you, your camera takes a picture and every single file is the same size. It's the amount of, it's amount of dynamic range of color it's, it's actually storing. And the more dynamic range, the, the bigger your file is and your histogram will look different. Two, two little questions. Um, yep. is, is the yellow triangle on your histogram a normal setting? And the other quick question is when you selected lighting, did it go to the upper left-hand corner or did you place it there? Or when you open up lighting, does it go right into that middle box? Okay, um, this is, the, it has a little bit of warning because it's telling me that the number of images I had cached, um, that it's, if I want to go backwards, in up elements and get back to my third correction backwards that I'm, I'm running out of cash because it says cash level four. So ignore the little warning sign. That like that, that sort of, I had to go in and look at it and say, really, I don't warn me about my histogram. There are things you can do um, that will show you if you're peaking, if you're, if you're, um, blowing out your your highlights or, or your your shadows. Then um, your other question, Jill, about when I went into lighting, um, which box? You mean the the blue box that it picked? Or? Yeah. Oh, that, uh, no. I, I was wondering if when you go to the lighting setting, if it just defaults to the very middle, as in that is the midpoint of all of the shadows, midtones, and highlights. Because it looks like you've selected the upper left. Is that correct? Oh, oh. This this little blue thing here, the little blue histogram. Oh, I I was seeing I was seeing the uh, the white like horizontal line with the arc above it. I thought that's the photo that is displaying. No, no, that's the one they're suggesting. Oh, that's the one they're suggesting, and you selected the one with the blue box. Right. Actually, oh. I I ended up also then sliding it myself and making my own decision. Again, you know, a lot of the auto contrast and contrast is the difference between your, your shadows and your, your highlights. That was horrible. And the auto levels was, looked horrible to me. Um, I'll do it sometimes and then quickly undo it. I, the auto, the auto ones, sometimes they work really well, but 
you know, I, I, I ended up sliding and, and I knew on this one that the problem was the shadows. I knew that, that, you know, I just started with shadows rather than highlights. The highlights looked okay to me if we could just get a little bit more of the shadows out. And every monitor is going to be a little bit different. Um, this is a lot brighter on, on my monitor than on the other computer I was using. Um, just, it's just going to be, and that's why it is, useful to look at, at the histogram. You know, and I did go through and the midtones were fine where they are. Again, your camera does really, really well with midtones. That's what it likes. Um, all cameras are set that when your exposure is right in the middle, it's exposing for midtones, which is 18% gray or grass or um, reds or midtones, the dogs, you know, all the, the fur on the dog is midtones. So the, usually your midtones are fine. It's usually shadows and highlights. And most people tend to um, underexpose. And when you underexpose, you're going to have <laughs> less data. Uh, again, the more you can expose a little bit to the right, you can always add back in shadows. But you don't want, you don't want it peaking all the way um, so that so that you, if you, it's like this, um, uh, the whole thing of, you know, is the parge too hot or too cold or just right? There's this just right point of exposure because if you go too far to the right, you're, you'll not record any of your highlights and what you're, when you print, you're actually printing right to the paper. So again, here on the next screen, I pulled the before and after and the difference of the, um, of the histograms. Hmm. Look, at the, look at the dog's mouth, for example, um, and the eyes. And this is just one little adjustment. So all we've done so far, I know people, People say, I don't want to, I don't, I like being out, being a photographer. I don't want to sit at the computer and do edits. Uh, but, you know, your cameras are only so good in terms of, of exposure. And uh, it, lighting is really tricky. And again, all of these adjustments you can do on your iPhone with Snapseed. But here's the clue is is a, don't use exposure, do your shadows and highlights because those are your, those are the most important part of, uh, of photography and lighting is shadows and highlights. Um, so your highlights def give you detail, your shadows give you sort of definition. And it's really interesting if you, if you look and I, I don't know how much on, comes through on your monitors, but you can see some fur flying off the, the end of the dog's sort of back end there on the right hand side that's totally lost in shadows on the left. Um, can you see it everybody? There's just like mm -hmm. a couple, you know, and but they're there. That's the other thing is that you when you're going out with your cameras, you're recording a whole lot of stuff that again, if if you're if your um, exposure is not adjusted, you're you're missing those those highlights. It. Look at the detail in the back part of, of the dog in terms of there is no detail on the left hand side. Um, and, and when you first look at it, it's a pretty good picture, but, but the dog really has um, the dog really has tonality on its side that, that just disappears in the shadows. Um, so these are simple things. These are not like, you can go really advanced in editing and, and I do it, I do it, but, um, but simple things can, can make a, a big difference. I also am sort of wondering where that dog's other ear is. <laughs> the, <back. laughs> the more I work on it, I'm like, what, what happened there, buddy? You have one that's folded down? <laughs> It, but you don't see it as much when it's in shadows. All right, so 
so everybody gets the first two things we do is we crop to, you know, sort of tell the story. And then we look at how well is it exposed and we look at the shadows and the highlights and we, we pull out the detail that's really there and, and missing. So the next thing you can sort of mess with is, is the color. And um, on um, your simpler editors, it's gonna be tint and temperature. And tint goes from sort of, you know, fuchsia to green and temperature it goes from some blues to yellows to reds and, and color adjustment is, is, has to be done very subtly. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it does work to do some adjustments to color. So I'm going to cover that. So when I went to the color part of Photoshop Elements, there are three things you can adjust, saturation, hue, and vibrance. And when you look at these panels, again, it pulled up the suggestions and that little arrow, little curvy arrow with a line is their suggestion. Um, I very rarely will, um, increase saturation unless unless I'm trying to make something look um, really uh, that saturates the colors it exaggerates them and and you can see um, in these panels that a lot of times um, saturation just makes it look too artificial sometimes I even will decrease the saturation a tiny bit or I'll decrease it in a section of the photo and I'm, I'll explain how I do that. I think that 99.9% .9 of the time, I never touch the hue. Um, we don't need purple dogs, green dogs, pink dogs. Um, maybe if I was taking a picture of a uh, dogwood, I want to do the hue, but uh, not a whole lot. Vibrance is probably of all the color changes that I use, I might make a picture more vibrant. And vibrant just is the brightness of the colors, whereas saturation is, you know, it goes from being like reddish to fire engine red. The um, vibrance is just how much um, brightness the colors look like. But with all of these, um, a subtle touch is, is really needed with color. And be aware that the way it looks on one monitor may look very different on another. So I've, on the next screen, another option is sharpening. Um, and I over-exaggerated the sharpening in this example. Um, the problem with the sharpening is that it's going to, the way it does sharpening is it sort of makes your um, pixels more coarse. So it, it adds to it. Um, and so what we have is like on the upper one, the way it looked, on the bottom one, he's like pretty, he's pretty pixely. But there are times when I do sharpening and, um, but I do it a whole lot more subtle than the example on, on the screen. And oftentimes I will only sharpen the dog and not the background or the, you know, the, the um, item, but be very caref careful with sharpening. Um, any questions? Karen, can you pick a certain area in sharpening? Like if you just wanted to sharpen the eye, can you do that? Or does it just sharpen the whole picture? This would sharpen the whole thing, but I'm gonna show you how to do um, selected edits because that's the next step up um, yeah. is to say, I just want to sharpen the dog. So perfect segue in. Um, and then the next screen, there's a tool. And now we're, uh, you 
going to do this in Snapseed, but now we're now we're going into you need a you need an um, an editing. This is what separates the free editing tools from the more advanced editing tools is when you can start to go in and do selected edits, and that makes a that makes a huge that makes a huge difference. So on um, the menu bar on elements, it's this sort of magic wand um, little icon. And you want to also make sure on the bottom that it brings up these different, different options. And what happens, um, it's got a fairly good artificial intelligence that you can see on this bottom little menu that I, I exaggerated. Um, there's a thing called select subject. And the way this works, both in, you know, the, you know, the big expense Photoshop and also in apps, is that it's looking for, um, it's looking for contrast. And so sometimes if it's not doing it well, you can like really make your picture contrasty and then it do it. But if you click on it, or if you use any of these different tools and you sort of draw along the dog, but try first select subject because it often works. You get this, these little, see these dashed lines. And if, if we were live in it, they'd be sort of moving and they're called the marching ants. A lot of people call them marching ants. And what it's saying is that I've selected all the area in there. And then down below, there's the add and then there's a subtract and there's these brushes. And if it if it has something missing, I can go in and brush where I want it to be selected and where I don't. Then I can bring up, I can bring up any of the tools that I action. So that makes a huge difference. So say I want to sharpen the dog but I want to leave the background less sharp or I want to, again, maybe I want the background to be shadowy. I could go back and change my highlights and my shadows just on the dog and not on the, not on the background. Or if in the case, maybe I just wanted to do the eye instead of select subject, I would take one of these little selection brushes and I would just brush on the eyes, you know, and I might only do the right eye because the left eye looks nice and bright, but the right eye is a little bit less bright. So I can start to go in and pick where I want to make, make my change. And when you're doing those types of changes, um, I often will make screen image bigger, even if it doesn't fit even if the picture doesn't fit all in my screen. And this little hand thing, I can pull it and it will, it will take where I want to go on the image or I can use the little magnifying glass because you really want to know where your edits are being made and where they're not. Like I might want to go in and say, yeah, there's a little bit more around the nose that I want to do. So that's the way you can do selected edits. So we have a, another stock image of um, this dog running towards you. And the reason you might want to do select edits is what's going on on the right-hand side of the dog's face. It's shadowy. It's shadowy. In fact, you've got blown highlights here you know, on the left and you're in shadow on the right. This is what happens when you go out and take pictures at noontime. You can see where the sun is coming right across the doggy here. So you can't use the, you can't use the adjustment tools that would adjust the whole picture because we're already, we're already on, on, you know, shaky ground in terms of the amount of detail on the um, sunny side of the dog versus the shadowy side of the dog. So the only way 
and it's a really great picture. You you would be feeling really great if you got the dog in motion coming towards you. It's so hard to do to get him in focus and get the tongue. The tongue is so wonderful. But that eye, that eye is so shadowy. So what we want to do is we want to fix part of the face, but not all of the face. And that's where selected adjustments make a difference. And so... Again, I ex over-exaggerated a little bit of this adjustment so you could see the difference. Um, probably the one thing that happens is that sometimes you start to get pixely if you have to pull too many shadows out because you just don't have the data uh, um, there. But I, I overdid this a little bit to show that the details are there. And the only thing I adjusted was this portion of doggy's face, the, the, where the shadows were. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, it was using the tool and just, I can't do select subject the whole because it will be the whole dog. And again, I can't touch the highlights that are, are on the left-hand side of the dog. There's just too much, there's too bright or already there. I, you know, if I, went over um, and did it everywhere, I would lose it. And I, I could have, I didn't, but I could have gone inside the, the right hand ear a little bit. I just, I just concentrated more on the face. Um, and he's probably a little blacker here. You know, I, I, again, I overdid it just to show the details there and how you can, you can change the picture by the adjustments. So what can you do with Photoshop elements with the quote unquote enhance tab? So the enhance tab has a lot of auto options and the auto smart fix will do everything for you. <laughs> and again, sometimes it works like magic and it saves you a lot of time and you can try it. Auto levels adjusts um, contrast. It deals with the color a little bit. These are just different options all the way to um, haze removal, um, smart tone of the skin. It can take some shake out. I'd be very careful with all this, the shake reduction because it's just sometimes will distort your images. What I tend to use in this tab and, and suggest, if you don't wanna just use the quick panel, is you can go to the enhance tab and you can do adjust color, adjust lighting, adjust the smart fix. That's if you used it and then it's too much, you can adjust it down. You can convert to black and white. You can change the color of the photo and haze removal can work really well. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples. They also have adjust sharpness. And again, um, if you don't want to auto sharp, you can just do a little bit. We could, again, take that dog's fur, go inside and do a sharpness. Smoothing the skin um, tries to detect skin tones and, and just will do that. This one I haven't tried, which is open closed eyes. That sounds crazy to me that it can see that the eyes are closed and add somebody else's eyes. I, I don't know about that. Um, I would not, these are, are sort of weird to me, adjust facial features. Uh, that's like taking it, I think a little bit too far, um, shake reduction. And then moving photos is something where you can create um, a 3D image on your photo. A lot of the, the smartphones will do it too. But these, this is another way instead of just using the few tools. And the reason I like the adjust lighting is it gives you um, a, another option besides the just the shadows, the highlights and midtones. So um, this was a waterfall that we or let to waterfall clap on the next screen. 
And can anybody see the difference between the left and right photo? Haze. Haze, this is haze adjustment. I did two things, I did that. I also selected right in the middle and I, I played a little bit with darkening that little, that little area, but then I went back and just hit the haze reduction and it did a nice job. Um, and again, don't auto use the slider, but haze can really um, take that sort of, you know, now if you wanted to keep the waterfall ultra silky, you can also um, do the selected adjustment and say, I'm going to do it everywhere except on, on the water. You can, you can decide where your haze adjustment happens. And, you know, and again, all of editing is subjective. On the left, it's more sort of ethereal and sort of mystical. On the right, it's sort of more detail. And that's just something that, that it, you know, I like them both for different reasons. And that's the thing, and when you have a picture, and you have capture, you can do things. But this is this is haze adjustment, um, and you start to see you start to see the leaves on the left hand side that were totally missing on on the left one. You start to see them on the right hand picture. Again, what's your style? It it pops the um, leaves in the foreground too. That's haze adjustment. Um, you also have, so again, you have the menu items at the top that are very similar um, to starting to be similar to Photoshop. You have your tools on the left-hand side that we use crop. We can talk about the spot fix, um, but you have these filters to enhance, which will give you some of the same tools as this basic on the right, but these, these menus give you a whole lot of options. In your filter, you have a couple of things that you may want to know about there too. The art, artistic ones are all sorts of funky things that you can change your picture into a drawing. You can do lots of things with it. You can change um, um, brush stroke distortion. You can spin it so that, you know, we were playing with, with um, with fall leaves of this spinning sort of thing. Um, noise, this one is an important one that if you have a picture that's very pixely, um, you, can, you can smooth out the pixels um, by reducing the noise. And when you pull noise up, it will also ask you if you wanna add noise, because sometimes I will um, actually adjust a picture and then realize there's a banding or something and I add a little bit of noise to the background to break up some problems, but that's like advanced stuff. You can use sketching, um, texture, there's a number of different things. And sometimes what I'll do, everybody asks about the background, is sometimes I will select the subject, I'll inverse and say, I don't want it, I want it to be everywhere except on the subject. And then I will add a blur to the background. And the blur that I tend to use is called the Gossamer blur um, or a Gossamer blur. So in this case, the reason that, that on the next screen, um, doggy is all red is that I selected the dog, but I told it by, I selected the subject, then I went to the select menu and I said, inverse the selection. So now I'm telling, I'm telling the system that I want to block the effect on the dog and only have it on the areas that are not red. And that I do by, again, I selected the subject. I went to the select menu. I did inverse. I could have done shift control I on Photoshop, it just shift I. And it will show me by red what all 
is selected and I can refine edges and I can see, you know, is any of the dogs still there? Did a, did a really nice job just by selecting subject to, um, to pick the dog. And I decided, well, I'm gonna blur the background. So on the next one, it gives you an example of um, I pulled up the blur. I said, I want the radius of the blur to be 27 pixels. And, and this is just, it's, it's subjective. It's showing me as I'm doing it, how much blur. And again, I've over, I've overdone how sharpened I want the dog for sake of demonstration. I'd never have them quite this sharp. And I've overdone a little bit of the blur of the background. But you can see the dog in having done what's called a mask or selecting and blocking out the dog from being affected by this edit, I've now, I need to let Missy in, wait a minute. I've now gotten this really soft blurry background but the dog remains very textured. Questions, does that make sense in terms of, you can see the advantage of, of these selected edits that can be done and, and we can <coughs> definitely can do this again Sharon. we're going Sharon. we're going pretty yes about that background and you select the number of pixels what is the difference as you slide it left or right for is okay. it blurry or less blurry or if i go to the left it's less blurry if i go to the right it's more blurry and there'll be a point at which it will be um it will start to look like color bands <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, and, and so the amount of blur you want to do um, is it really it really can it can vary. But yeah, you can make a really soft soft background. Um, and again, your your mask and and how much feathering you just play with it to make sure that it looks realistic. But you know, a lot of the pictures that have blur behind them, there's two ways of doing it. You can do it by depth of field, or you can do it. Um, in post-production. Thank you. So I, I, have, I have a little... Go ahead. I have, I have a little marching ants story and I'll be very brief. Um, both of our children were soccer goalies and one time our son was practicing at a soccer field and a photographer came up to me and said, is it okay if I take pictures of your son as goalie? I said, absolutely, yes, here's my email, send me the pictures. He said he was going to use these pictures for, for stock photography and make profit. So I got these gorgeous pictures and one of them, like my son was like right up by the top bar, like jumping up. It was like flawless. I said, wow, that picture is amazing. He said, yeah, I used the magnetic lasso, which is the same as the marching ants. And I pushed him up. So while my son had a beautiful jump up, he was not near the top bar. <laughs> But the man moved my son. So like, it's like the dog, you could move the dog around the photo with the marching ants. Is that correct? You can. Uh, to fill in and I'm gonna cover a little bit about removing and, and adding to this. So the other option, and this was a bizarre thing because on my computer here, this option didn't appear, it did on my other computer, but there should be one that says a guided option, and then you can pick what you want to do. And these are really pretty, pretty cool. I just have to figure out why on this, this version I don't have it because I wanted to demonstrate it. But if you hit the guided option, one of the things you can do is mail, move and scale objects. That's what um, Jill's talking about. Um, you can resize, you can sharpen, lighten, darken. You can also remove something. 
So I picked the um, remove object in the guided option. And what it did is it pulled up this little set of steps and it said, do you want to use the brush, the lasso, which is just, you would, you know, draw around whatever the option is, the quick little wand. There's different ways of, of getting those marching ants or identifying what you want to do. So I picked this rock that was in the left-hand one in the front. And then what it had is it said, remove object. I clicked on that button. And before that, I could add or subtract to the area selected. I hit remove object, whoops, sorry. And then afterwards, there was still some funky little edges here. And I used these other tools, the clone stamp, and I moved some other sand elements to cover it. I also played with selecting the subject and starting to duplicate and created a number of extra rocks that were there. So that was a, that's a really, if you have the option in the version, if you use these guided ones, they, they walk you through doing some fairly advanced things that, you know, again, I do in Photoshop, but these were, these were, were pretty easy to do. So now we come to the expert view um, and I can do a number of things in the, I can pick expert. And now I'm starting to have um, a program that looks pretty much like, um, like Photoshop. What it's, the difference is um, as you're doing edits, you can create a number of layers. So the fundamental difference on these different views is my tools on the left-hand side are a little bit more um, options, but the biggest difference is it gives me a series of what it's called layers. And every time I do an adjustment, I can a layer. And so my first one is always called background, the one at the bottom. That's what it came in with. And if you look really careful on this thumbnail, you see that the rock is still there. So before I make any changes as an edit, I will duplicate that layer because I always want to be able to go back if I make a horrendous bad mistake. So I create another layer and I call it remove stone. And I did my edit on that layer. Then I said, I wanna play with some color adjustments. And if you look, I've taken and desaturated a lot of the color at the very top of it. I've made a, a very different look. It's harder to see in the thumbnails, but that's color adjustment. But on this layer, it's the layer I'm selected right now. If you look above it, my opacity is 28%. What that is, is if you remember in the old days when some of us were in school, we had the old um, overhead projectors with the clear little, little layers that would go one on top of the other on top of the other. Well, I made an adjustment to the color, but I didn't want it to be as strong. So the opacity layer is only 28%. It's less than full strength. And what happens in this editing is that as you make different changes, you can, you can change how much opacity there is of any one change, or you can remove the change completely. Um, a lot of people get confused with layers, but the layer that's on the top is the one that is, um, that applies um, currently. And you can turn this little eye symbol, if you, if you turn that off, it no longer, that stone will come back. So I want to demonstrate using the advanced method. 
hopefully, if my computer cooperates. Um, let me... All right, let's see if I get this to cooperate. All right. All right. Is everyone seeing the um, Adobe Photoshop elements? So again, to open it up, I go to photo editor. And you see the workspace. Okay. So there are different ways of opening up, but I'm going to open up a file by going to File, Open. And let's see, we'll pick the stone. <clears throat> And so I just want to orient you first to the workspace. On the left is a series of tools and the tool options. Um, I'm clicking on the bottom. It's showing me options of the tool that I'm, I'm currently highlighted on this side. I have my pull down menus across the top. And Sharon. here. Sharon, I didn't mean to interrupt. I don't know. Yep. Has everybody else seen what Sharon's saying? No. No. It hasn't okay. come up. No. Let me try again. No, but okay. do interrupt because that's good. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing and try again. Okay. Uh, there we go. I may have to share my whole desktop. See when you see. There's the stones. And yeah, we got it. It's got it. Yay. All right. We'll do this again. Anytime, tell me, because it's a combination of my bandwidth and the way and the way it, it shares. So the way I opened is I went to file, open, and I pulled up right from my directory rather than from a from a bin. And it pulled up this file. That's the file name. I have tools. And on the right, I have, um, I do have my histogram. And the way I got that is I went to, um, I went to view and no, I went to window. Everybody see the pull down window? And one of the options is the histogram. And this, also lets me do different things. I can also go to history um, and it's showing me the history of all the edits that I've made. Um, so this is a really handy window to have. Um, uh, and the histogram can be, and I'm gonna try to make you bigger. Come on, big. Oh. Um, it can be colors or it can be just the luminosity. And so I'm just going to show you the histogram. This is a pretty, the histogram's pretty, pretty good histogram for, for this. Here's my layers. The first thing I do is I will duplicate my background layer. And you can do that by going to I'm going to right mouse click on it and say duplicate layer. And it says as, and I'm going to call it my edit. Whoops. All right. So now I have two layers. And if I do something like I'm going to remove the stone. I don't know if you can see. You see the marching ants around the stone now? 
They may come up. Yes. It's very small. Yeah, you, you got small. it. Oh, there there it go. is. Now we got it. So I have the marching ants around the stone, and I can do a number of things with them. going to do it a different way. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the clone stamp. And I'm with the clone stamp, you see the circle that's coming? Mm -hmm. yeah. On that edit. Let's see. What it's doing is it's letting me pick, whoops. And I'm cloning in very roughly. I'm just cloning in the sand, covering it up. I'm just gonna do it really quick and when I do it, I pick different different areas so that it's not a repeating pattern. So I'm just gonna do a messy, messy edit for purposes of this. Okay. But if I turn off this layer, My machine is totally not being happy with me. All right, so I turn off there, the stone's back. So the beauty of layers is it's a non-destructive way of doing editing. Now say I wanna, I wanna pick the subject, I wanna pick the rocks. I go to select, I'm gonna go select subject and it's thinking. So you can see, I've got these little, if you can be with me and try to see, you can see little ants walking around there. So I want to remove, because it grabbed the cloud. So I'm going to remove the cloud from, whoop, now it's adding it. Wait a minute. All right, so I've expanded the screen. You can see that I have marching ants around the rocks. And now- You I'm, only have them in the cloud from what we see at this moment, I think. Okay, I just, it's just coming. In the cloud. It's coming. How about now? Better, you just have a tiny bit of cloud up in the top, on the top rock. You just have to, can you pull down your marching ants and tad on the top rock? That's what I'm gonna do. So it's plus, I wanna, I wanna do minus. Uh, so I go to subtract and very carefully, I'm gonna try to subtract the ants up there. Okay, close enough. Now I go to, and I say, well, I'm gonna create another layer and because they were selected
Only the rocks are there on that layer. <laughs> Can you give that layer a name like rocks? Mm hmm So I go and I can rename the layer. So one thing I could do is those rocks are exactly on top of the other rocks. So I'm going to drag them and look, look at what we have now. Has it come up? There it is. Mm -hmm. So, on the picture that I had on the class, the heron in the moon, I had the heron on one layer that was cut out and the moon on the other, and I just moved them around. People want to know how I, I do that, is you can add an image by cutting it out and adding it to a layer. And then, and this this is this is pretty this is pretty good in terms of getting most of it. There's a little bit of you can see there's a little bit of blue in there. I could erase that, but that's how that's how you can um, that's how Jill's uh, son was elevated up by cutting it out and moving it. And there's all sorts of, of things you can do. And what happens is you can see and. Photoshop is that when you get just this sort of um, grid behind, that means there's nothing, there's nothing else. Now can you make that smaller so it looks perspectively correct with the other rocks? So like if you put it further down towards the middle of the picture so it looks like it's further away, can you make those rocks smaller so it look like they're further away? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Just my computer. My computer's just saying, you're really asking me to do a whole lot all at the same time. Are you kidding? <laughs> all right. All right, so now I've got tinier rocks and I go to my move tool and I can even cover up. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? All right, so say we don't want the rocks. I just make that layer go away. Again, the beauty of layers is non-destructive editing. You're not committing to anything until you merge all your layers together. So say I don't want to do something silly. Say I want to do now an edit. <clears throat> I'm going to make another layer. And I'm going to call this one um, something less silly. I'm going to call it adjust. Just for, and it's good to label your, your layers as you're doing them. So now I'm going to go over to Enhance, and I'm going to go to um, Adjust Lighting. And if you notice on your computer, I'm hoping this, this is coming up, under the Adjust Lighting, on the basic one, we had Shadows Highlights, we had Brightness Contrast, but now I've got something called levels. Everybody see the histogram that came up? Now I can take the middle and I can adjust the midtones only. I'm dragging this middle point. And you can see on my luminosity, 
one on the right, it's changing. And say I want to really darken it, and then I'm going to change my highlights. Now say, okay, I wanted it to be nighttime behind, but now the rocks are really, really not showing. What you can do with a layer is you come up to the layer. I'm, I'm going to okay this for now. And then I'm going to take this little uh, square with a circle in it and it add something to the right. You see the now on that that layer, there's a little white box to the... I'm gonna come over to my colors. I'm gonna reverse this. This is like the magic of... Uh... This is the magic of, of Photoshop. Come on. Here we go. All right. And I'm gonna get a paintbrush. And they have this special one that's called a enhanced brush. Now, inside this square, I'm going to start. I'm going to use my paintbrush instead, sorry. And I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. And you see, I'm painting on the rocks. And I'm painting them black but I'm painting over to the right of this layer. Anybody know what I might be doing? Creating a mask. Creating a mask. I'm telling the program, I want this adjustment everywhere except where I'm blacking it out. So if I come over here and say I want this rock and this rock, everybody see the difference? I'm going to take the mask away. I'm going to put the mask back. It blocked the edit any place where I have black on the right hand side of that layer. Now I might say, well, you know, I, I really darkened it too much. So I'm gonna take the opacity and say, I just want it a little bit of an error edit. So this is what you can do with layers. I'm gonna do before. And after it's it's very subtle or I'm going to do something even more extreme I'm going to go in and I'm going to um, I'm going to make it and again this is for purpose I'm going to I'm going to go to my auto lighting and I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to go to color and I'm going to adjust saturation and hue. And I'm going to, if I take saturation all the way negative, let me just, I'm gonna get rid of the other layers. Oops, put this one back, sorry. All right, so everything's black and white except the rocks in the front. Now, if I say I want, and you can see where the blue is, say I'm, I want it the other way around, I'm 
I'm going to go to this mask. Hmm. Is I made the rocks black and everything else color. I'm going to get rid of that, make that color. So everybody see how I did that? So this layer, if I pull the mask away, the rocks are black and white. Everything's black and white. Now I'm blocking all the changes except to the rocks by having a mask. Everybody get sort of layers and, mm -hmm. and then again, the reason why these rocks are not black and white is they're underneath where the mask is. So that's like real advanced crazy stuff that you can do. There are practical applications of why you might do masks. Um, I'm going to get rid of a bunch of the layers. So if we go to enhance, <coughs> if I go to enhance and I want to adjust shadow and highlight, Right now, it's only doing it on the rocks. <clears throat> not happy with me. If I want to change color, like questions on layers, does everybody sort of get how the layers are working? Sharon, how do you change the color of the mask from white to black with the rocks being white? Um, well, this is going to be black there um, because of it's going to be black because I'm, I'm, I'm inside and I'm actually using the black on top of it. If I select something, I'm going to go back to this one and create another layer. And um, select there and this one's showing me different views here. So I can mask this way. Dennis. So if you go to refine mask, it allows you to have different looks of your, you can have marching and have an overlay. Um, and the advantage of doing that is it you can sort of paint a little bit better with the overlay. Does that make sense in your view option? So just look for refine your mask when you have your mask up. And then look for view mode. Is that your question, Dennis? Yeah, I saw the keystroke being K to just uh, invert the mask. Yeah. Like that? Yes. Okay. So let's 
now that we've like totally done crazy things, um, <coughs> let me do a little, little more subtle with our little dog friend here. Okay, so first thing I do, I create another layer. Shadows, and then I'm going to use the wand and I'm just going to pick the eye area. And I'm going to do it with the last one. So here's the area that I want to do. I pick up my enhance. I go to lighting, shadows and highlights. I'm going to lighten shadows. You see the eye coming out? Yes. And then to get rid of the selection, you control D. Now that's not very subtle, but you can make it a lot more subtle in terms of the transition. But you see how you can pick how to do the eye. So say we're not happy with that. I'm gonna delete that layer completely. Another way to do it is to create, put your mask in. And then what I can do is say, I want to go to enhance. So this is that didn't work the way I wanted to. Let me just I don't know why it's stuck on on seems to be stuck on that one. I have no idea why it's doing this, but it's not. Let me try to get out of. Here we go. So if I go to it, well, it's. For some reason, it's not letting me do what I want it to do at this point. So here we go. There's something quirky about when you have certain tools. So this did overall changes. And if I wanted to go in, I'd go on my mask, I'd pick my brush. If I didn't want it to See how I'm painting black over here? Here's one, here's two. 
and you can then see the, the changes. If I want to pick just the dog, I go up to select, um, I'm going to go to the magic wand. I'm going to go select subject. Let's see how well it does it. Everybody see the marking ants now? Yeah, they just came up. Yep. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good selection. And you can see there's a little green here between his toes. I can decide to with that. See, one of the options is I can out I can um, send it to a new layer mask, or I can send it to, that's what I want to do. Now you see my mask over here, the, the dog and black would be that no changes would be made to the background. If I go here and I inverse, now it's blocking the changes on the dog. So I can go up and say, what I want to do is do something like, do my blur. Wait a minute, it's gonna blur the mask. Wait one sec, I gotta get from back. All right, so now I go to blur and you have to be clicked on. For some reason, what it's doing is it's, it's staying stuck on the, here we go. Sorry about that. My computer's being slow. So I go to blur, I'm going to gossamer blur. And let's see what happens. Everybody see what happened? So say I want him that blurry, but I don't like the fact that it's on his ears. What I can do is go here, make sure I'm clicked on the mask, and now I'm painting back in. You see how I'm just going back over the edges to get the detail where it blurred into the mask. So one of the things people always say about, about layers is in masks is black conceals, white reveals. So again, I'm going to just do it. What do you think? Sharon? If yep. you, uh, you might want to mention that you can change the color from or reverse the color so that you can paint out part of the black by using white. Mm -hmm. The where I'm doing that, what um, Dennis is saying is right on the left here with color 
is usually in Photoshop, I'm able to reverse it just with a click. And this one is a little bit more kludgy. So if I do, again, if I do black, black blocks the effect. So I can paint back the grass. Then if I also say, well, this is sort of a little bit over the top. Remember opacity. You see what opacity, changing it to 30% opacity. Now only 30% of that effect of that layer is coming through. 100%, 30%, And the thing about non-destructive is that our original image is still there. I can throw this layer out completely or I can or I can um, keep it depending on what I want to do. If I do another layer um, and I throw the mask away, I'm going to throw that layer away too. I'm going to this layer only has the background, and I can change the, if I want to, I can enhance the color. Which is an exaggeration, you know, again, I can make it more saturated. When I bring back the other layers, you can see the difference. If I don't want it that saturated, again, the opacity of the layer affects the adjustment. Everyone get what layers are doing. Whatever changes you make on that layer is only on that layer. And they're all, um, they're all going to be, if I take this layer and put it on the top, it undoes all of them. So the top layer is the one that's controlling, that's, the, that's controlling everything below it. So if I, depending on, on where I want to do it, if I want to, again, um, if I adjust his eye, um, some of these tools are not quite as easy to use as, as they are in Photoshop, but they're pretty, they're pretty darn good and powerful for for what you have. Um, this is a color replacement brush. Um, let's see what that's doing. I'm not a hundred percent sure. There are also your standard um, enhancements. This is a spot healing brush. The Band-Aid is always spot healing. And what I'm doing to make my brush bigger is I'm hitting the bracket key just to, here it is. So say I don't want the spot, I need to be on the last layer. Oh, I know. The problem is if you do any of the healing, you have to have it at 100% op opacity or else it won't do it. So what I'm going to do is go back to original guy here and demonstrate just a couple more things. So over here in these enhanced tools, um, I'm 
I'm trying to figure out what the, the smart brush does. No, oh, I didn't like that. So let's. So what, if you ever do anything, you can either, um, you can go into your histories and it has all the different, all the different types of uh, steps that I did here. So histories are really important. And if I say, well, I sort of like the change here. If I delete down here, they totally go away. That's the only thing you have to be careful of, but I can delete this. Now I only have my, my background layer. Um, So a couple of other other tools that are over here are your clone stamp that if I use my clone stamp, if the alt key will select the area and then I click on it and you see it takes whatever I want it to borrow. So if I wanted to have, if I wanted him to have this fur, and put it over here. Now he's got that fur on that paw. If I don't like it, I can undo it. But say I wanted to move some of his fur over where it, the highlights are blown. Um, again, the alt selects it. And then I carefully use the stamp. So I've added some fur into, into where, um, where the highlights are, are blown. You just have to do it very, very subtly and very carefully. I did that. I have a picture of, of um, some, some kingfishers and I lost, the, I lost some of the, the highlights. So, um, but again, if I clone the alt key selects, and I say, I'm gonna put this fur here, here, here. Now he's got black fur on his little bit exaggerated. Um, dodge is to darken an area. Spot healing is just a spot like this, grass that was here, that was bright. And you can change it. You can say, I want it to be a proximity match, create texture or content aware. So content aware, if I, um, It's going to add healing. So that's the that's the history tab. And again, you can you can go through and undo. The other thing that happens is if I have um, say a lot of layers open, if I go to layer, I can either merge my visible ones or flatten the image. That will save a lot of space. So I might turn a couple of them off and then say layer. Um, merge the visible ones. And now after I've got the layers, it gives me a much smaller file size. So any questions? I know this is. If you save it as a JPEG, you can't undo it. But if you save them as a uh, Photoshop file, then anytime you reopen it, then you can change it. So what Dennis is saying is your options for saving is you can save it as a PSD file and all the layers will still be there. The history won't be. Um, and that's also true if, if it's a, a TIFF file. 
um, but they'll be they'll be large files. When I export, I tend to do save for the web if it's going on the web, because then it will the colors will be correct, and you can save it. I, I never save it as a GIF. I would save it. Um, I would save it as a JPEG or a PNG, and you can do different things. So JPEG high. Um, and I embed the color profile. And then for posting online, I always have my um, longer side 240 and it, the, low, the height 1600. Um, so if you save anything um, higher than 2400 and post it on Photoshop, it will um, automatically downgrade the picture. So one clue is, is when you save out of um, elements, save, do, um, save for the web, have your long side be 2400 and um, whatever your, your height will be. So the original is 55 megapixels um, as a Photoshop file. Now it's 2.4 because it's and it shows you the the quality next to each other. So I have one question about your uh, the fact that I noticed you were working in RGB, which is a, a website resolution. Yeah. So if let's say we wanted to print out this photo of the dog and you've made all of these changes using Photoshop elements, can you convert it to CMYK and all of your changes are saved in that? Um, you can change the, in your, your color settings. Um, this is the way I would do it, Jill, is to optimize it for printing, let it right. get color management. And it's, it's interesting on my Canon printer, um, the Canon software will, will do the conversion for me as long as I pick what type of paper. Rather than have to get into color space, um, and most of the help is really good throughout um, throughout this. It you know it it if color space, so it's it's really it's really good. Other questions? I know we got really complex towards the end and <laughs> layers. Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, Dennis, how did you get your Northern Lights background on Zoom? Is that, did you take that picture? No, um, my particular software version, if you go into uh, stop video and then backgrounds, it's one of the stock ones that uh, Zoom offers. I can't import pictures because of my software version. Very beautiful. Of course, we all know Northern Lights from Sharon's class. One yeah. point I might add, um, when you bring up and you have a, a slider available, you can move that back and forth and it'll give you a very good idea of the effect of the filter. Yeah, sometimes um, you can do it to the extremes and say what you what you really like the most or don't like um, about it. Sharon, I have a question. Um, first of all, this class was great and a 